the assumption that they've made is that the economics are so simple and easy and straightforward that even I could handle it, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, Henry's on here as well. Obviously, he's done all of the heavy work producing all of the biology. I just get to sit in the office and use my old ca calculator. <laughs> Rick, <laughs> I don't use a spreadsheet. I use a calculator. Anyway, so much for that. So, obviously, all of the biology that's been discussed today is critically important. We've got to have the biology. But when it got to to John and Mark, well, then it's about the economics, right? How does it fit, right? For all of you producers, well, ultimately it's the economics. So I'm going to work on that. When I did this two years ago, I sat down and one of my friendly colleagues said, good luck with that, okay? I won't <laughs> mention any names, but, but some of the ideas. And so uh, I, I'm more and more convinced since uh, uh, two years ago that these concepts need to be considered. These are the issues that I think are important for us to wrestle with. How you price the corn grain in the field. I think we all agree that to price silage, you need to have the price of grain out in the field. Okay? How do you do that? Second is plant nutrients. We'll discuss that. And then I won't say any more about shrink. Okay, we've talked about shrink. Obviously, that's important. I'll, I'll, I'll show how it affects the economics a little bit. First on plant nutrients. In the past, in, in, in many, at least university pricing systems, the purchaser of the silage was asked to pay for the plant nutrients in the fiber forage part of the, of the corn silage, right? When you buy corn, that's built into the price of corn, right? What, what that producer had to use for fertilizer to produce the corn. But when we take silage off, we're taking off more, so that needs to be included in the price. Okay, so the corn producer, and when I, I'm going to discuss this as if it's a separate person like John talked about buying a lot of it, okay, in, in many of the cases that is, is going to be on the same operation, but it's the same principle, okay, but the corn producer uh, wants to be paid for those extra nutrients. On the other hand, if we return the nutrients in the manure, Unfortunately for us, I think in the feedlot business, we've not been good at selling manure. I mean, that, isn't that an understatement? <laughs> we've not been good at selling manure. And so the corn producer wants to charge us commercial fertilizer price for the nutrients we took off, but they don't want to pay us for those same nutrients coming back in manure. Am I right? Yeah. We got to be better negotiators. How much manure? Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, the work that uh, Galen uh, referred to when he was a graduate student without distillers feeding 45% uh, uh, silage diet. He had the other levels in there. But I'm using this to show the nutrients that uh, are, are in the manure then. Um, and the, uh, I don't know about the rest of you that are this old, but I gotta have my glasses on. Uh, so it's, it's the amount that's excreted, and you can see that the animals are, uh, uh, excreting 96 pounds of N, this is per animal, on that diet, and about a 50% loss as volatilization, so we've got the 48 pounds 
of nitrogen in the manure from that animal, okay? And with phosphorus, most of the phosphorus, the, the animal uh, 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 doesn't retain a lot of the phosphorus, and what's excreted uh, a little bit is in the runoff, but most of it's in the manure, okay? And in fact, the phosphorus can be an issue. Because the phosphorus can be an is issue, um, there are options uh, for spreading the manure. One would be that one could rotate corn silage fields every fourth year and haul the manure back on that because we're, we're producing about four times the phosphorus in the manure okay, that the plant's going to be reusing. So we've got to be out there about a fourth of the time. So you could, you could rotate silage fields. In a lot of cases, uh, the silage field you want as close as possible for hauling uh, reasons, and so that may not be the best option. But, but you get, uh, you help the silage uh, cost the most if you, if you were able to do that. The other option then, if you're cutting silage off the same field every year, that you just deliver manure every fourth year. Another possibility is to spread annually, but on a phosphorus basis, so you're, you're spreading a fourth as much manure, so then you've got to increase cost of spreading because you're spreading light, okay? So those are the options. I'm gonna primarily talk about one year and four. Now, in addition, to supplying those nutrients that you took off as, as, a, as silage. There are other benefits to the manure. Rick Kelsch, Crable has come back from the dark side administration, right, back and has been doing a great job talking about manure and value manure. There's a, a new scientific publication, it's, it's an international one, on values of uh, uh, summarizing experiments looking at manure. Increased crop yields, actually more crop yield than commercial fertilizer. Increased soil microbial biomass, which is good for the soil. That maximum increase in uh, yield is when it's 50 to 75 percent of the nitrogen that's required, okay? Uh, but not all of it. Uh, Decreased nitrogen losses because a lot of it's in an organic form uh, rather than as, uh, let's say, uh, ammonia or nitrate. Um, uh, increased uh, water stable soil aggregates, better soil structure, and increased soil carbon uh, uh, that's, that's due partially to the microbes. So that the manure, not only is it returning those nutrients, so do I sound like I'm on a it just dripped water on me, but Bob, is that okay? I, am, am I rained out? Is that a, anyway? Um, so, uh, am, if I'm on a soapbox, I'm on a soapbox. We have undervalued manure, okay? And this is a good case because getting manure back onto those corn silage acres is tremendously important, right? Because we've taken a lot of forage off, and I won't even go into the uh, cover crops, but obviously that fits super well. Okay, I went the wrong way, didn't I? Yep. This has been shown by both Andrea and, and Galen on, on the silage yield, but this gets to be really important uh, as we discuss uh, the, the value of this silage. To, to, to get to the price out in the field, we've got to know what that yield's going to be. So I've summarized this uh, with the percent grain, again, from Rose data. Um, and uh, uh, at black layer, and, and, and the point is that it's about 42% dry matter at black layer and 38 at, uh, at one week before black layer. And so for my economic calculations, I'm going to use 38 
because I think, as been discussed, I th while we would get maximum yield at 42, I think the risk for shrink becomes an, enough greater that, that I would be reluctant. I think Galen feels the same way. We'd be a little reluctant to, to be recommending 42. So if 38 is our target, that's what I'm going to use. And it gives me about a 6% uh, yield drag. Okay. All right. This may, that's one of the more important things. I mentioned this, pricing the corn out in the field. This is good data, Dan, out of, uh, out of the dis uh, egg decision maker. What is that? Dis <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, this is uh, because it shows the soybeans, but it doesn't matter. Uh, soybeans are unimportant, right? It's all about corn. Uh, that's a, supposed to be a joke, but there was not much <laughs> laughter. Uh, so what happens from October to June, July? As a percent, it goes up uh, 14 percent, something like that, right? Uh, that's what Mark was talking about, right? About the price of corn goes up from harvest. It's the cheapest at harvest, so nobody wants to sell any corn or silage in the fall because it's so cheap. Now, I like the word cheap, right, students? Uh, but, but. In this case, it may not be the best thing. Anyway, anyway, so, and now, this is storage cost. I'm intrigued by this one, and it hadn't struck me that the importance of, of putting it into storage, you had to have the storage facility, right? And you had to put it in. And so that first day that it's in there, you've got a storage cost. And so that's why the, the line doesn't start at zero, right? It starts at 30 cents a bushel. And then goes up as the corn is stored. What's my point? If you store the corn, you're paying storage costs. If you're the corn producer, and you say, I want to price the corn later. Uh, oh, yeah, but I've got to pay storage on that. Okay, because I'm pretty simple, I'm just equating these last two figures. The increase in price of corn and the cost of storing the corn are, are equivalent. Bottom line is the corn for silage needs to be priced at harvest time. Because you, as the purchaser of the silage, you're paying the storage, right? You've got the silo. You've got the interest that you've got the money tied up. All of that, you're paying that. If the corn producer doesn't price it then, right, he's having to pay the storage cost. And I could get into the storage thing, but I, I think about, right, as you drive around, bins being built all over the place, right? And it, for those of you a little older, does it amaze you to see it stored outside at elevators, right? Just amazing. Why? Because we're producing so much more corn. And so for a lot of producers, they don't, they don't have a storage. Uh, John or Mark, somebody mentioned this about, uh, actually, they want to bring you high moisture corn or silage because they don't have the storage, OK? Well, you shouldn't pay them for spring price of corn if you're doing the storage. You with me? We've not been good negotiators on the silage. I, I, I think about that, right? As negotiators, you, know, you want to negotiate with the cattle buyer, but you're not, and you take, they take advantage of you. Everybody's taking advantage of us as cattle people, right? All right, so quickly through this then, uh, corn price, in the uh, uh, fall, increases fall to summer, okay? I found this, I don't know where the marker is, but you see where after corn price, there's that mark. It's supposed to be an arrow going up. 
So it's supposed to be as corn price increases from fall to summer, uh, about 47 cents a, a bushel. I don't know how that got changed to a cross from an arrow. Is there some kind of a subliminal message there for me? You got my point, didn't you? Uh, anyway, so I'm saying that corn price increase is roughly equivalent to storage cost. You with me? So we need to be pricing in the field. Uh, fall basis in Nebraska is about 39 cents a bushel, which is roughly equivalent to that same number, okay? Okay, so um, I, I priced uh, September. I did this back on April in April because I was working on the economics, right? Uh, and at that time, uh, corn would have been 373 with the basis adjusted. It's 412, okay, minus the basis. All right. Then the next issue is uh, harvest, hauling, drying, and, and loss in storage of the dry corn at 47 cents a bushel. That's from our Ag Econ people showing custom rates for harvest and so on. So the net in the field is 326. And then I went through the calculation with a 263 bushel yield uh, and uh, so on, with uh, got to the amount of, at, uh, at black layer and then adjusted that with the 6% yield drag. So I came up with uh, 28.69 a ton in the field. And remember now I'm starting at 373 cash price uh, at that time. Corn's come down since then. Okay, so don't. I'm, I'm trying to show you the principle of how I went through it, not necessarily absolute values. And then, as I do economics, what am I going to use for my my corn price? I'm going to use the 412 because remember now, corn is going to go up. So as I feed corn through the year. I'm buying that corn in, you with me? And it got more expensive. I've got, I own the silage now, but the corn's getting more expensive, Mark, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so now taking that from the field at the uh, 2869, uh, I had to add to that the fertilizer value, but then I subtracted the manure fertilizer value Okay, and that's hauling one year and four. So that's meeting the phosphorus need of the plant and uh, uh, some of the nitrogen. Obviously, you had additional f commercial fertilizer. So the net price in the field is $26.99. Uh, manure spreading uh, cost is $0.50 cents, uh, uh, per ton, of, back to per ton of silage, as is silage. Uh, and then the, again, a custom rate that's published by our Ag Econ department, about $11 per ton for harvest, haul, and pack. And, and when John was talking about, he was talking about a, a, a cost per acre. Well, it depends on whether you're pricing it per acre and then what the yield is versus per ton. I use the per ton to make it easy for calculating here. And then you can look, uh, that, that gets us, uh, and $2 for uh, storage cost, uh, that's a net of uh, 40 49 into the feedlot. And then if you do 10% shrink, that increases it to 44 99 You with me, how I've done the calculations? And what I've got in parentheses then is the percent of corn price at that point. I just realized that it says silage price to feed bank. It's supposed to be feed bunk, obviously, not feed bank. I, I don't understand. We've got a great secretary, but sometimes she just doesn't read my writing. Can't guess what I'm thinking, okay? 
anyway, so much for that. So obviously the more shrink, uh, the, uh, the uh, higher the, the, the price of the silage. Now, as you look at those percentages, if you just use book values for TDN, for example, silage would be in the 80% range, as much TDN as corn grain, okay? So if we've got values here from 68 to 78, they're still below, right? And when I say value, that would be the cost relative to corn, okay? Uh, Galen used a, a five trial summary. Uh, I've used the first four trials out of that. And because they were fed the same number of days, I adjusted this to equal final weights and then added the days that it would take to get to that. Um, and uh, he's discussed the biology, okay? So if you look at the net dollars down at the bottom, at 15% corn silage for those, it was 650 per head, whereas with the 45% silage, it was 1975, okay? So it was more economical in those four studies, but where the cattle were fed the same number of days and I made an adjustment. More economical to do the high level of silage, right? All right. Uh, I, I, I want to emphasize what Galen was saying, and these are just the uh, uh, data from Dirk Birkin where he fed different ratios of silage and distiller's grains, and I want to emphasize the importance of distiller's grains and how this worked. You sh Galen made that clear, but the old data of his when he was a graduate student before distiller's grains and what we do now it, it, it have the difference in, uh, in uh, value of the silage relative to corn, right? Big difference. So the, the distiller's grains is critically important to this. The question is, is what the level is at the do you 40 or 20% or, uh, uh, tw uh, distillers. You can see my net dollars again at the bottom. Uh, that that net is uh, better at the 40, partially because the distillers is uh, is a less expensive source of energy than the corn. I should add, in all of these cases where I'm pricing the distillers, I'm pricing it equal to the price of corn. I'm not making it cheap. I'm making it equal to the price of corn on a dry matter basis. Okay, but not a lot of difference between the 20 and 40, but a little bit greater response, right, to the higher level of silage with the 40%. I would emphasize again, like Galen was, feeding higher levels of distillers. That diet that's 40% distillers and 45% and silage doesn't have any corn in it. And that was the most economical diet. Okay, Lauren's data has been shown. This is where it went, uh, uh, the 15, the control diet, and 45% uh, uh, all the way through, and then the 75-15 that Galen just, just described. Okay, I like this because the cattle were taken as close as they could get to an equal fat endpoint, right? And the cattle were heavier, right? The cattle on the silage diets were heavier, and that makes a big difference. That's why in Nebraska and Iowa, we feed cattle to heavier weights, right? Because it makes money, as long as we're not getting way too fat. Okay, so the net, the response here is uh, on the 15 percent, $27, about 84 at the 45. 
a little bit less at the 7515, partially because the way that worked out, uh, there was actually more, a, a greater proportion of the feed was silage, right, Lauren, on, on the 45. Uh, to, to do the, to get it equal, you would have need to fed a few more days on the 75 before you switch, but that's, that's why. Okay, the point is, the higher levels of silage, because it's less expensive than the corn, is making it more profitable. You've, you tracking with me on my net values here? That's, uh, well, however many, $55 or something like that per animal. That's significant. Okay, so then I wanted to discuss uh, a little bit in the grower diet. Andrea uh, covered this well. Uh, she, these two are part of her four, series of four, but the point I'm making is that uh, Henry used 15% distillers and Lauren used 21 and uh, the data are, are, uh, are positive for using the higher level of distillers, and I think it's a protein response. I don't think 15 is enough for newly weaned calves. Okay, now, my bottom line is not net, okay, because that's really hard to do with uh, backgrounding cattle. So it's my cost to gain. So the lower number is better. So the cost to gain was, was considerably less in Lauren's data because see a better performance, which I think is due to the, the distillers. Remember now, the distillers going from 15 to 21 is doing two things. It's a good source of RUP. That's probably most of the response. But it's also got a lot more energy even than corn silage. Okay, and I'm going to get to that. Now, this is also interesting because in Lauren's study, because they were looking at feeding 75% and then shifting to 15, the cattle were weighed so there's a growing period, right, when they got shifted. So now I'm looking at just the growing period. Which is a unique data set. Okay, and again, I've, my bottom line is cost of gain, not net, okay, because it's growing. Um, at the 45% level, the cost of gain was, uh, what, three cent, nearly three cents less than at, with a finisher diet. Remember, this is the growing period, but the 15% is a finisher diet. So we're talking about during the growing period now. And it allows us then uh, uh, to calculate a silage value relative to corn, which came out to be 96%. So in this growing period, the silage was looking really good, either at the 45 or the 75. So a way to look at this is a calculation like uh, Jason did, uh, putting this on a cost per unit of TDN. Uh, it, 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 the, the last, in fact, I'll go back to that. This is unique because it's the only time we've had a finisher during a growing period that we could compare the silage back to the corn, and that's where I came up with the 96%. Okay, this is, is an alternative way to look at that for grower diets. May apply to finishers, but especially to grower diets. So the, the cost per pound of TDN, uh, uh, the silage at a 10% loss at uh, 8.2 cents, per pound of TDN. Obviously that goes up at a 15% silage loss. My hope is that you're going to be in that range. 
hopefully at 10, but between 10 and 15 anyway. Some of the pictures that some of our speakers showed wasn't in that range, but that's what we're, that's what we're working on, right? Okay, corn grain using that uh, uh, 4.12, uh, uh, dollars, yeah, $4.12 per bushel. Remember how I did that now, right? That was the futures price in the fall, and I'm assuming that's going to be the average price for the year of, of, of actual grain. The, hopefully you understood what I was trying to make. Yeah, can you guess what I'm thinking? Um, corn grain at 9.9 uh, .9 cents per pound of TDN. Dil distillers grains and solubles, this would be wet. In grower situations, it doesn't matter. In finisher situations, wetter is better, Galen says. So wet is better than modified, which is better than dry, right? In grower diets, our data would say it doesn't matter. But it's got uh, over 130% the energy value of corn. Right? It's got a lot of energy in a grower diet. I can't emphasize this enough. If you think about this, look at the cost here. Distillers priced equal to corn is 7.6 cents per pound of TDN compared to 9.9 .9 for corn, and it's even a little cheaper than the silage, right? So distillers is our best buy for energy. And what are we getting in addition? For nothing? If we're buying it for energy, what are we getting for nothing? RUP, right? This is why it fits together. I could go off on a tangent. But quite frankly, the ethanol industry is what's influenced all of this, right? The ethanol industry and feeding wet byproducts was a major reason I think we shifted away from corn silage to corn stalks because it covered it up, right? I don't have corn stalks on here. Who said corn stalks was, did you say that was cheaper or did John say that? Was it cheap roughage? You said that. And you were wrong. <laughs> First time for everything. First time for everything. <laughs> we could tell some stories though, Mark, yeah. Anyway. Uh, see, class, where was I? Right? I lose my train of thought when I get to joking. Um, corn stalks cost. Corn stalks per unit of TDN is more expensive, just like the hay and the... Uh, 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 at 70 or 80 dollars a ton is more expensive and uh, uh, Jason talked about that right it doesn't get any well you understand what I'm saying is how the the ethanol industry has affected all of this but for us as cattle feeders we've got this opportunity now with corn silage and the distillers to go with it it's a great mix right it's just changed all of this. Okay, to summarize, uh, obviously the price of pricing corn in the field is really important. I say that's really important. I did the calculation, and on my dollars per head on the finisher, it amounted to about six or seven dollars, right? So some of those were like fifty dollars difference. That's just due to the biology, okay? But, but pricing the corn correctly, I think, is important. Manure value and, and getting value for the manure is important, and obviously shrink's important. Uh, obviously, it's very economical in grower diets, or as Jason indicated, in uh, cow diets. Uh, and the importance of the distiller's grains, I've uh, harped on that enough. In finisher diets, we believe it's economical. It's got to be managed well, as everybody has talked about today. And then the question of uh, uh, 
maybe the, the most optimal distiller's grains to corn silage ratio, and then, of course, the two-phase system that Galen talked about. With that, I'm done. Questions for Terry? On table six, seven, and eight, Terry, so it comes down to a net dollars per head mm -hmm. and showing Im improvements with the different diets as compared to what? I mean, was there a controlled diet? That right, that 15% silage would be considered a control. That's a good question. Again, you should, we were supposed to guess what I was thinking, right? 15% um, would be supply of roughage in the diet, you see? So that's our control. So why is it that number zero? Uh, if 15 is the control in each of these tables, is that what... Is that what I, I could have done that. I could have done the price, cattle prices and so on to make that zero, to okay. show the difference. Uh, I, I didn't do it that way. So it's the difference between the numbers is what's important. Okay. Yeah. I don't recall, were most of these diets, <coughs> wet corn diets or were they dry corn diets? The question leads to is there an interaction there between corn type, second, or second corn diet, and if there's not, would this not support putting up all silage in the bunker instead of the wet corn to look at? Right. Uh, 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 Will's question is about switching from uh, uh, a high moisture. Should, should Blackford switch from uh, his high moisture corn bunker to an all silage bunker? One problem is you can't store as much. The density is different. But, but it's a good question. Uh, it's a very good question. Will, if you feed... Oh, 30. I'd like to be feeding 30% distillers and 40% corn silage. You're sure not going to have a problem with high moisture corn. You're not going to have an acidosis problem, right? Uh, I would say in most of our studies, it's a mix of dry and, and high moisture corn that we're replacing. But that's a good question, right? Are we really proposing that you switch from high moisture corn to corn silage? It's a good question. Uh, that would be a, a more in-depth economic analysis than I'm prepared to make. Yeah. Other other questions? Okay. Let's thank Terry. Thank you.